good morning. I'm going to give a talk today about some of the research we're doing on white sharks um, in Algoa Bay. <coughs> in July 2010, we got funding from the Port Elizabeth municipality. Um, they were interested in getting an idea of the occurrence and distribution of white sharks close in shore, as well as at the Bird Island MPA. They wanted information uh, on the risk that uh, bathers and water users might have on the risk of encountering sharks at certain beaches and at certain times of year and of course that information is important to be able to manage water sports activities to time the, the, the event uh, to be outside of the time is when you're seeing white sharks. Information on the white sharks of Bird Island, they were interested in that for the feasibility of maybe developing a cage diving industry at Bird Island. There's currently two permits up for grabs to develop cage diving at Bird Island, but as yet no one's taken those. So until very, very recently, we knew almost nothing about white sharks in Algoa Bay. And all previous research, or almost all previous research in South Africa on white sharks have been conducted in the southern and western capes and have focused predominantly on the adult component of the population. All we really knew about white sharks in Algoa Bay until recently was based on anecdotal reports from fishermen. And what we did know was that there was a high proportion of small white sharks being caught. So it sort of started leading to this hypothesis that maybe Algoa Bay is a nursery area for white sharks. And that hypothesis was sort of further supported in about 2006. We towed a whale carcass um, out to a place called St. Croix Island and we sat there for about two months to watch white sharks come and feed on it. And what was interesting, firstly we didn't see many white sharks, but the sharks we did see were all less than three meters long. Some of the sharks we were seeing were as small as one and a half meters. So again, it sort of started le leading into this idea that our Goa Bay has a lot of small white sharks. You know, the white sharks, the small ones are separated from the main component of the adults in the Western Cape and the warmer water in Algoa Bay and abundant food supply, you know, would really sort of maximize growth for juvenile sharks in Algoa Bay. So, the Metro was interested in getting more information on white sharks in the bay. So, the first component of the study was to conduct monthly trips to Bird Island to really investigate, well, is Bird Island an aggregation for white sharks or not? Now this is the first study in South Africa to study white sharks in an area that's not currently influenced <coughs> by cage diving and chumming. So the information we collect could provide the, 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 the first di direct comparison in the altered behavior of any on white sharks pre and post chumming. And that might help to illuminate this association between cage diving and shark attacks, which is alleged by some opponents to cage diving. And also, information on white sharks of Bird Island would, it, it, again, it, it sort of lends to the feasibility of could cage diving be established at Bird Island. So for those that don't know, <coughs> here's Port Elizabeth, here's the harbour over here, Bird Island's way over here. So it's not like being in False Bay or Huns Bay or Mossel Bay where you can just hop over, what, a couple of k's, you're there in five minutes. That's a 120 kilometre round trip. It's a long way, it's expensive, the weather in Port Elizabeth is terrible, we've got you know, strong winds, big swells, there's a two hour journey there on a good day, it's a, it's a hard place to work. So this is Bird Island, Bird Island is actually the, <coughs> so here's um, St. Croix, this one. So we actually, when we towed the whale carcass out, it was actually towed out by um, MCM. We, um, we actually moored it in Cooker Harbour. We actually had white sharks come in and feed on the carcass when it was in there. And then we used to make little trips out almost every day, just anchored it <coughs> in there. Alright, so this is Bird Island. You've got the big main island, Bird Island. I guess that's maybe six, seven hundred meters long to give you an idea. Then we've got a stag, seal, and black rocks. So this is the home, this is the seal colony. 
It's a series of about four or five rocky outcrops on big swells. The swells go over there. You know, this is small when you can compare it to what you guys are working with at Mossel Bay, Huns Bay, uh, and False Bay. <coughs> this is the research boat Yucablana, which we kindly get to use. Without that boat, I'll be honest, we would really struggle to do the research that we do in um, Algoa Bay. So this is the boat we go out on. <coughs> it's sponsored by uh, SIAP and uh, by the ASAP program at the moment. So we go to Bird Island once a month. We've done 26 trips to date from November 2009 to July 2012. When we go there, we record the number of sharks, the size of sharks, the sex of sharks, and also a whole heap of environmental parameters. So we use pretty much standard chumming practice that everyone else does um, in South Africa. We've got our seal decoy, we've got a big sort of tuna head or something on the float to the back, um, and then we've got um, we stole this idea from the tiger shark divers up in Aliwal. We take um, an old washing machine drum, fill it with sardines, suspend it. We suspend it just below the water. And again, it's just a nice way to get that chum out and keep the sharks um, interested in the area. You know, it works quite well. I don't have interns, so I've got to do all the chumming <laughs> myself, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, so here's the Bird Island um, uh, group of islands. These are all of our um, chumming points and you know not surprising we've concentrated almost all of our effort around black crops that's where the seals are but you know we sort of tried a whole variety of spots. We used to go there every month throughout the entire year for two years and you know in the summer we weren't seeing um, any sharks around black rock so we started trying other places to see if the sharks were there. <coughs> and we had uh, the red ones are where the sharks have been seen and you know we've, we've seen sharks elsewhere around the Bird Island group but it's predominantly around the seal colony. So in our 26 trips we've seen 62 different sharks. The sharks have ranged in size from one and a half to um, four and a half meters. We've never seen a shark bigger than four and a half meters. We've never seen a mature female shark. 67% um, of the sharks we've seen are less than three meters. They're juveniles. That's a higher proportion than anywhere else in South Africa. Again, it's sort of tying into this predominance of small sharks in Algoa Bay. Interestingly, we've had a, um, a, a, a bias to a number of female to male sharks. So we get a bias of two to one. Again, similar to other uh, sites in South Africa. Strong seasonality in the occurrence of sharks. Again, we only ever see the sharks in the winter months. This is a, a, a two year span here. Again, it's what we see elsewhere in South Africa. The sharks are timing their arrival just as the time when the seal pups are entering the water after weaning. You know, inexperienced, limited swimming abilities. That's what the sharks are preying on. We also take photos of um, the entire seal colony at Black Rocks, on the land, just on the landward side of Black Rocks. So we wanted to try and quantify the number of uh, white shark bite wounds on seals. <coughs> this is um, that's our sort of distribution of white shark occurrence, and then the bars are the number of bite wounds. And cut long story short, there's no significant correlation between bite wounds and sharks. Probably because some seals are getting bitten inshore in the summer where the sharks are. We know from our acoustic telemetry data that even though we're not seeing sharks when we chum, sharks are around. And thirdly, seals are targeting, I should imagine, the small seal pups and of course they get eaten. There are no survivors. But the most important, well the most interesting thing from this was uh, there's very few injuries, uh, there's very few predations by white sharks on seals. We've seen one natural predation in 26 trips. You guys see 40 predations in a day. So it looks like white sharks are having their predation rates on seals are probably having a very very small impact on the seal population of black rocks. When you compare that to 200 seals being washed off on a single storm event 
and as a 75% mortality rate, you know, white sharks are having little effect on the seals at Bird Island. And when you compare the number of bite wounds we observed <clears throat> with a study 20 years ago by a lady called Stewardson, the results are almost identical. So again, it sort of suggests that maybe the abundance of white sharks around the island have also remained relatively stable over the last 20 years. You know, the predation rates, as it were, are fairly similar. Like pretty much everyone else, we collect photo IDs, we take photos of the dorsal fins, we've got the GoPro, <coughs> put it in the water, um, and we try and create a fairly comprehensive um, catalogue. So for every shark, we've got the dorsal fins, we've got the tail marks, we've got the flank patterns, the gill patterns, and we put everything onto one single sheet, and it's proving, you know, a good way, it's a, it's a good comprehensive photo library that we're developing and we've already had, um, I think it's 25% of the sharks we've seen, we've seen on multiple occasions. <clears throat> so this is the sort of data we can uh, pass on onto um, Rabir's project. <clears throat> Alright, the second part of the project was investigating the occurrence and the distribution of white sharks close in shore. Are certain beaches like hotspot areas for white sharks in Port Elizabeth? So we had funding to do uh, 43 helicopter flights and a little R22. We flew from Cape Reef all along Backline up to the inside of St Croix. We flew probably about 100 meters from Backline, flying at an altitude of 300 meters, and at that height you can accurately identify any animals up to two meters in size you basically got a field of view of about 500 meters. So we can accurately see sharks really within 500, or let's call it 600 meters from the beach. <clears throat> we saw 50 sharks on those 43 flights. Uh, the most sharks we saw in any one day was seven, a lot less than um, Allison Seas and False Bay. <clears throat> we would see little red dots are where we see sharks. So we can see there's a lot more sharks to the north of Port Elizabeth Harbor than to the south. We never saw white sharks on our aerial flight south of Port Elizabeth Harbour. We saw a lot more up here. That water, it gets deeper off the beaches a lot quicker. There's mega rips. Um, there's just more, the, the ocean environment, there's a lot more dynamic. There's probably more primary production. Possibly that's causing a, a greater abundance of prey and hence more white sharks. These areas in black are fishing locations, and I'll, I'm going to talk about what the anglers catch from the shore just now. When we were flying, we'd see sharks as big as four meters, but 96% of the 58 sharks, or the 50 odd sharks that we saw, were all less than two and a half meters. They're all juveniles. We rarely ever saw any sharks bigger than two and a half meters. We would see sharks as close as 20 meters to the beach, and as far out to um, 500 meters. Again, strong seasonality in sightings, as at Bird Island, only in the, uh, in the winter months. Inshore, only spring and summer. We're not seeing white sharks close inshore in the winter. So you've got that nice delineation between offshore, Bird Island winter, inshore, summer. Here's some of the photos of the white sharks we saw. The nice thing in a helicopter, you see a shark, you quickly circle, you know, descend down to 50 meters, 100 meters, and you can, you know, very clearly take a nice photo and identify those sharks. We'd also see, you know, hundreds of little hammerhead sharks. Remember, these sharks are, you know, this big. This is how clearly you can see them from a helicopter. We'd see whale sharks. I think we saw a few bull sharks. <coughs> We also saw, this is actually a picture in Cooper, I showed this a couple of years ago. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, at the time I thought they were gully sharks. These are all smoothhound sharks in the shallows in Cooker. So here's the beach. The sharks are literally in water a couple of meters away from you. All females and all pregnant. Hundreds of them. I've got a fishing project in Cooker and every year when we go and fish there, we pretty much see this congregation of sharks every single year, literally within two or three weeks of the same time of year. 
Um, we're doing a lot of acoustic work. So as you know, 39 white sharks were tagged internally as part of the O-Search project. We've got, our, we've got a, a massive array of VR2s in Algoa Bay. We had funding to um, tag a further 20 sharks last year. We managed to tag 12 externally, uh, sorry, uh, 16 externally and four internally. We've got funding for another 22 tags this year. So we're getting a really nice, massive data set. I know Enrico was talking about the different ways you can deploy your listening stations. What we do, we've got, these are brake drums from Algoa bus. And we've got, you take three of them and you basically put them in like a bit of a pyramid formation, chuck them overboard, and then you go down and you bolt them on with flat bar. So you've got a pyramid of three 50 kilogram brake drums. And then we basically put an iron pole just in the hole, and that's what you attach the VR2 to on. Because we were interested in the inshore movement patterns of sharks, all of our stations are in 12 meters of water, 500 meters from the beach, so you can imagine the big waves coming through and the dynamics of the ocean environment that close and that shallow. You know, we need that 150 kilograms weight. Otherwise, things just get washed away really quickly. So, like other people, we tag them internally. We use a modified <coughs> spear gun. You just put the tag head on top of the spear and you shoot the uh, tag into the shark. It works really, really well. We also tagged white sharks internally. We take them onto that big research boat. We have Dave Zimmerman, who's one of the chief Sam Parks vets. He comes on board with us to oversee everything. We've done four um, white sharks. We only tag sharks smaller than two and a half meters. Otherwise, they're just too big to handle. Every single shark that we've tagged internally has been recorded at least four months, five months, six months after we tagged it. So none of the sharks we've tagged have died. This is just a quick overview of um, all of the VR2 stations we have in Algoa Bay. Just out of curiosity, with the 39 O-Search tags, the 20 we've tagged, so that's 59, we've had 62% of all tagged sharks picked up on our listening stations in Algoa Bay. At the Sundays River Mouth, we had 22 tagged sharks at that station alone. We had 22 there, about 20 on that one, 18 on that one, 18 on that one. Even here, the popular swimming beaches in Port Elizabeth, we've had tag sharks being picked up. So the metro, the Port Elizabeth metro is, is you know, very excited about the information we're giving them to help them manage their water sports activities. So just to wrap things up, so we've got white sharks, you've got offshore distribution in the winter, inshore distribution in the summer. The sharks seem to be far more prevalent to the north of the Port Elizabeth Harbour than they do to the south. We've got a high proportion of small sharks, less than two meters long, many are less than 1.7 meters long, which suggests that Algoa Bay is a nursery area for white sharks. <coughs> information gained from the project, let's say the Metro are already using the information we're giving them to help manage events like the Iron Man event uh, the nippers life-saving events they'll change the location or they'll change the time of the year based on what we're telling them with the risk of encounter and of course the more information we get on the movement patterns of white sharks not just in Algoa Bay but of course this links to this collaborative partnerships that Enrico was talking about through throughout South Africa you know the better we can understand the movement of white sharks which is of course key for their management and conservation thank you very much